any case, I'm Mark. toxicity, and as uh, you'll see, uh, the present and past use. So I focused my most recent research, well some of it took 17 years, uh, on two species native to the drier central regions of Asia where anatomically modern humans arrived approximately 35,000 years ago and probably encountered these two resource rich plant genera. And this is a recent book that uh, Rob Clark and I uh, published, University of California Press. And the other one is not a very good picture of a Federal, but it'll serve for now. So for a variety of uses, including psychoactive and medicinal, <coughs> humans developed very long and ancient relationships with species in both of these genera across much of Eurasia. And in the case of the Federa, in some arid, temperate areas of North and South America as well. So there I am with the Federa. Uh, there it is on the edge of the Grand Canyon, and that has been the ephedrine uh, has been extracted. We'll talk a little bit about the, the, the chemical history uh, later into what one of the names for Mormon tea, also known as Navajo tea, <coughs> Indian tea, uh, Brigham tea, Mormon tea, Borehouse tea, Squaw tea, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I want to point out the ephedrine and, and pseudoephedrine. The two active, the main active ingredient are only found in the old world, some of the old world species, but they're uh, nitrogen rich um, secondary metabolites in the new world species that do cause stimulation and other characteristics that have been integrated for th perhaps thousands of years into native uh, ethnobotanical use. So this gives you a picture of the distribution, which um, a rough di distribution worldwide of perhaps somewhere between 35 and 70 species. So Bob, we have the same problem. We have the research that you've been taking place it needs to be done on the ephedra species. Problems are there. There's tremendous variation within an intraspecific variation as well as interspecific variation. And but essentially these are small shrubs to sprawling shrubs, and in a few cases vines, and they're adapted to dry, rocky environments, and in a few cases grasslands. So it's mainly the arid regions of the world that it has been long distance dispersed to, rather than uh, plate tectonic or vicariance. Uh, it's spread by the wind and for some species, other species uh, with fleshy bracts that appear like a fruit that are edible in many cases and become a useful uh, part of the plant's uh, relationship with humans. Those are often attractive to birds which spread at long distance and in some cases where there are a lot of uh, rodents, uh, like in the New World especially, it spread, those species spread by rodents. Now in addition to its physiological therapeutic effect, uh, in an appropriate set setting, we'll argue that ephedra alone or combined as it, uh, we'll see some archaeobotanical evidence, uh, with other substances in the past and perhaps in the case of Homa or Soma, a long time uh, problem pl uh, plant in terms of uh, identification for the, one of the uh, most important plants in the history of Iranian and Indian uh, traditional uh, religious use of psychoactive species. So the ephedra of alkaloids, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine and the others that are uh, potent uh, were actually only extracted, the first one, ephedrine, in 1885 by a Japanese chemist who was working in Germany and then forgot for about 30 years until it was quote unquote rediscovered and some of the other species, uh, other alkaloids, were identified. And uh, that led to one of the great discoveries in uh, neurophysiology, and that was the identification of alpha and beta alpha 1 and 2 and beta 1 and 2 receptors, which we now know are very important in uh, effects such as ephedrine, which can uh, cross the uh, uh, blood-brain barrier much faster than adrenaline. And 
why it came to replace the adrenaline for the use of asthma. And uh, it uh, is able to affect the um, limbic region, and, and part of that is the hypothalamus, and therefore affect emotion, as well as other aspects, including stimulation. So, as Bob by yesterday at the general meetings mentioned, and Jan Selleck pointed out, those of you that use it or listen to this, maybe sparks will come out of your mind with the stimulant aspects of ephedrine, which have stretched and reached out uh, in good and unfortunately uh, bad ways uh, in our modern society as uh, enhancements for uh, weight loss or enhancements of vigor. And it, uh, unlike sarsaparilla, is, can be toxic, about one to two grams, and it's deadly. Uh, but in small amounts, usually in the plants themselves that have the ephedrine in Eurasia, uh, it's not toxic uh, unless you drink uh, lots and lots and lots of tea for long periods of time. So it reminds me of Andrew Wiles' uh, excellent essay on the difference between the green and the white and the extraction of cocaine from uh, coca leaves, or in this case, the extraction of ephedrine or pseudoephedrine from the ephedrine stems and other parts of the plant. So the species have an ancient history of use in Eurasia, especially, but not entirely in the arid areas of this huge region. More recently, we'll see that archaeological and archaeobotanical evidence, along with deeper understanding of relevant written records, have provided us with additional insight into the traditional utilization of this genus and the of unusual plants with very special alkaloids, of course, the ephedra in the ephedraceae, and these are uh, related to the conifers and their parts of the gymnosperms, very old plants, and some suggest that the ephedras may be a bridge between the uh, <coughs> conifers and, or the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. In any case, they possess some potent uh, alkaloids <coughs> and other substances. This is just two maps to give you an idea of the distribution of some species across uh, Eurasia, certainly not all, and uh, this one over here is a relatively recent study in China of those species that occur in the boundaries of China today. And uh, the more important ones we'll see are the uh, Ma Huang, which I'll get back to again. Uh, this is in the northern China into uh, Mongolia, and then some from Central Asia that are especially important in Armenia and uh, Jared Diana. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of, of the ephedras across Eurasia, like Dystachia, which is in uh, Europe, from the Mediterranean up to northern France and across into parts of Eastern uh, Europe and into Russia and all the way to parts of Central Asia. And here it is uh, in a relatively large amount. And then Intermedia, uh, which is farther into Central Asia, and you can see its adaptation to rocky, dry, or arid areas, and there's the fleshy uh, bracts that surround a tiny seed that are uh, utilized for food and are attractive to birds. Esquitina, uh, ephedra, again, to, uh, similarity in morphological appearance to horsetails, is another species that has a synonym here, which is Shenun, Iana, and we'll come back to Shenun, the legendary uh, early emperor and uh, first divine husband, uh, husband or uh, originator of cattle domestication and the identifier of supposedly 365 medicinal plants among those perhaps for cannabis and Ma, uh, Ma Si, the great Ma, and Ma Hawang, the bitter or yellow or golden uh, hemp being uh, the ephedra associated usually with uh, ephedra sinica, or Chinese ephedra. This one is unusual, named the uh, same name as Bolowski uh, horse, and uh, it has strange stems compared to the other, so it's more easily identified uh, as, at the species level than some of the others. And here's still another one that is known to have ephedra, it's been used as Ma Huang, uh, it was identified uh, in the early part of this century. Look at this 
species again. Now, moving on, I'm still uh, showing this one has been in the trade for uh, Mapa Wong, uh, or under the name Mapa Wong, as well as the Seneca. And this Seneca was identified in the 1880s, 1888, by staff uh, from Austria. And uh, this one is the most important. Thousands of tons of this have been, and to a certain extent, are still being sent abroad, as well as throughout China, uh, for use for stimulating tea and for its therapeutic bronco, uh, bronchodilation and for constriction of the nasal mucosa, so therefore for <laughs> asthma, coughs, fevers, colds, uh, and so it is a broad uh, herbal medicine history, and here you can see the way it's been packaged. And then another one that's very important and may be associated with the argument uh, that's risen again in the last uh, decade, that ephedra may be the answer to what was soma, or at least in some parts, as people moved out of Central Asia and down into uh, South Asia and into the uh, area we now call Iran, uh, and to the Near East, uh, the groups of people from that area that took this sacred plant and it had to be replaced as they moved into areas where it couldn't be found. So, uh, during the, even during the times of Romans or the Roman Empire, the Ephedra was well known and described until it was eventually dropped about in the Middle Ages. And so there was long distance trade of these dried uh, stems that can hold their potency for a relatively long period of time. In terms of the biogeography and the taxonomy, more work needs to be done. And in fact, new species have been identified in this 2010 paper uh, to the scientists from India have discovered what they've identified as two unique species in this part uh, in the Himalayas uh, in North India, two new species. Uh, well, interesting to start the ethnobotanical uh, part of this is that uh, Back in the 70s, when uh, uh, so, uh, Rose and Ralph Selecki uh, discovered this extraordinary cave in northern Iraq at Shanandar, the, uh, one of the more interesting aspects, going back from the 10,000-year-old horizon to the 50,000, roughly, year old <laughs> horizon, a burial in that cave uh, that included, as from the inside of this relatively large cave, and these drawings represent a burial that took place in in perhaps July, June or July, 50,000 years ago. How would they know that? Well, Selecki took samples of, of around the soil, around the burial, and those were taken to Paris and to the Natural History Museum, and the leading uh, paleontologist uh, there uh, looked at these, was able to identify eight different species. Seven of them have medicinal use even today in traditional ethnobotanical uh, use in the region. Um, and one of these was ephedra. And you can tell by the species that were flowering, producing the pollen, and they know the phenology of those species. They estimate that this person died young, relatively to us young man, in the early 20s, and was buried in a, fl buried in a flex burial, uh, which matches up with other uh, Neanderthal people. What was extraordinary about this, of course, is that the suggestion that people in Neanderthals have this sensitivity because the flowers, some of them have very pretty flowers as well as having a medicinal value, and they were spread around the grave. And the pollen wasn't found uh, disjunct, it was uh, or, uh, dispersed evenly uh, or randomly. They were in bunches, which indicated to the, uh, the interpreter Selecki and others that this, these were deposits of flowers around the grave for medicinal purposes into the afterworld or, uh, and or were just the beauty of the plants, laid on some uh, other plants, including the ephedra. And uh, that may have indicated some kind of, this beyond the medical, but also the possibly the spiritual connection. On the other hand, more recently, people have suggested maybe the pollen was brought in by gerbils or rodents who are known in the general area to create uh, uh, tunnels and move things around. However, I, I would argue that still a strong case for Neanderthal use for two reasons. One is the deposition is non-random, uh, and also some new evidence looking at the calculus, the uh, dental the material that's uh, plaque, in, uh, which has been used now for a couple of decades to identify species like coca chewing back to 7,000 years ago in parts of uh, Peru. 
But in the case of the calculus going back into 50, 60,000 years, or perhaps uh, a little earlier than that, they've been able to use identified plant material in this, and uh, that is one of the first indications that plants were being used, and also perhaps uh, the chewing of bitter, the bitterness is <coughs> identified that maybe this is an early indication that plants were consciously being taken uh, or consumed for medicinal use by the Neanderthal. Let's move way forward, but still thousands of years ago, to Central Asia, where uh, during the uh, period of the Soviet Union reign, uh, a, a Greek Russian archaeologist uh, discovered some sites and uh, or uh, excavated sites that have been recognized, but not for their uh, how old they were and their importance. But it wasn't published until 1990 after the fall of the Soviet Union, and this uh, created a big stir in the archaeological world because this these sites, the BMAC, Bactria uh, Margiana Archaeological Complex, of a series of sites in Central Asia uh, with similar aspects in terms of some of the artifacts identified as coming from Harappa or the uh, Indus civilization. And uh, what's important for our purposes here is that in this site uh, were discovered a, uh, a, a number of things. Uh, implements that uh, so, uh, the archaeologist interprets as being used to boil and prepare a combination of plant materials. And uh, among these were identified, according to his identifications, cannabis, poppy, opium poppy, a paper somniferum and a federal, uh, and or federal, indicating that refederus was in there too. Uh, this combination is important if, in fact, it could be uh, verified. There's been some that the seeds of cannabis have been interpreted by some as being uh, coriander uh, and but the <coughs> poppy, at least the opium poppy and the federal are pretty substantiated now. So what is going on in this particular situation? That Goner Tempe site is not the only one where implements or other evidence of sacred use in particular rooms within these temple complexes. And these are just some of the artifacts that are associated with the uh, preparation of special, and this is an advanced civilization uh, complexity compared with the Indus civilization based on seals and uh, what we might call coins that were and other implements traded, or at least a very similar uh, from one place to the other. Now let's move from Central Asia, north and east, into China, and uh, know that, uh, recognize uh, Shenun or Shen Nun, and uh, this divine husband in, in China about 5,000 years ago. It's a legend that may be really a comp composition or synthesis of several stories, maybe analogous to Homer, the blind poet, which some argue is just a compilation of many different stories uh, that are passed down. In any case, Shanun is identified, among other things, with uh, the use of uh, ephedra and also cannabis. So, ephedra sinica, mahuan, the primary species which has been used in China for probably more than 5,000 years, and is still being used in preparation of extracts around the world. However, the use as a stimulant and uh, for other purposes is not documented until the time of the ancient Han Dynasty. So the written records that start to really document this are only about 2,000 years old. Uh, we are going through uh, some colleagues of mine that are fluent in Chinese, uh, looking at the records to see uh, how far back they go. We have some 16th and 17th, 18th century documents that uh, identify a Federer and others uh, uh, have already done so. so we wanna, we're looking into that to see if it substantiates the use in the times of uh, and the kinds of uses that went on. So there are cemeteries recently in the last five years that have been found here in Western uh, China, like the Gamugao and here, in this case, it's very interesting. Over a hundred of the burials have twigs of ephedra on them, indicating <coughs> some special kind of medicinal and or spiritual use. They've been tested with uh, a variety of uh, electron uh, microscope scanning and also uh, other uh, morphological comparisons, etc. And uh, also, uh, Yergao, uh, there's uh, 
one named Jian, who we worked with before, he's identified there a few samples again with uh, that verify that ephedra was in that site. Uh, that site that goes back about 2,000 years. To finish up, we know that the ephedra is, is uh, become very popular on various levels. Uh, the extract of, from the plant itself, still in the plant state, but dried, powdered, etc., or extracted in ephedrine or pseudoephedrine used for many uh, practical uh, cold remedies, etc., but also ephedrine and the pseudoephedrine can relatively easily be made into methamphetamine, and that's become quite a problem, as you know, in various parts of the world. So to finish up here, I'd just like to say that in spite of its long history, promise the use of ephedra herb, it's declined through the years because of its toxicity and also the, now the connection with the making of uh, methamphetamine, crystal meth. And uh, unfortunately, but on the long haul, it's had such a long history of use that uh, I would suggest that we, uh, even with this connection with methamphetamine, that as Lee concluded his brief historical review, uh, to conclude, the Federal and Federal deserve an honored place in the history of pharmacology and therapeutics. To paraphrase the ancient Roman poet Horace, the abuse of a substance does not weigh against its right or proper use. Essentially, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. The wild Federa species remain. Okay, thank you very much. Could I ask you to put the next one? Yeah. No time for questions right now, but I'm sure Mark will feel